Both in her time as a student here at Hartford Seminary and now afterwards, Candace has helped us become a more welcoming and more accessible institution, and we are forever in your debt, Candace, for doing this for us. So thank you. Let's thank her. With that, I'm going to pass over to Candace, who will be uh, leading us with an open prayer, uh, an opening prayer, as well as comments about the program. So this is your turn, Candace. Thank you. I'm gonna move. Yes. Thank you very much, President Lohr. Can you hear me okay? Um, I'm excited to be in my, to be in the loom and to be in this position to be able to help with creating more inclusive and more communities of belonging in the faith community. Historically, religions of the world um, view disability differently. Some religions regard it as a curse from God due to the sins of either their parents or grandparents or the individual. Other religions regard it as a curse from the ancestors or they place the whole blame on the mother of the person with the disability. For some religious disability is believed to be linked to karma. Personally, I love karma. What comes around comes around. No, but sins that have been committed in the past lives. It's a punishment for misdeeds of past lives or wrongdoings of their parents. And most religions of the world that I found in my research view disability as a sin as a result of sin. Today, many religions and individual congregations have mixed feelings toward disabilities. Some denominations consider it to be a result of sin, while others think it's a biological issue and has nothing to do with that. And our views on disability, like our views about race, have been passed down from generation to generation to generation. And we seem to try to modify it with each generation as we become a little bit more enlightened about how we should think about each other. Many religious and congregations in the world are moving from exclusion to tolerance to inclusion and to working on creating communities of belonging. And today we will talk about the difference between those terms because it's an important distinction that we need to learn. We are here today to explore together what does it mean to create a community of belonging. I hope that we can change the way that we think about disability. I'm a disability rights activist and much of what I do and say comes from that perspective. And I very much identify with the disability community and my multiple disabilities. But I want us to think a little bit differently today our world is getting more and more divided in the way that we accommodate specific groups. I want us to think about getting rid of the special labels that we give our programs, our member groups, and to leaving our, and to disappear these labels that we have for each one, get rid of them leaving our shared humanity and the realization that we all have vulnerabilities and we all have needs that can benefit from faith communities using their collective access to support each other. I believe that each of us have times in our lives that we function better than others. We need to see that disability is a normal part of the human experience and not something that is just happens to you because of some, some reason that it's a basic, normal part. You have birth, you have death, and in between you might have disability. 
and unfortunately we don't talk about it enough. This can even be a part of the goodness of creation because each of us is unique and a part of the universal picture of the divine. I am just like you. We all have basic human needs to be loved. We have a basic human need to belong. And disability teaches us a lot. Disability teaches us about the respect for human limits. It teaches us about being vulnerable. It teaches us to look beyond the surface of our neighbor. I see so many signs now that say all are welcome here. But what are we really saying with those signs? And we have a sign that says all are welcome here and a person can't get into the building or they can't hear what you have to say in the sermon. We must recognize that we need to communicate with people with disabilities and we need to include the disability culture and yes, disability is a culture. That's another training we can do. We must recognize that we are limited by our own stereotypes and understand that our common thread is humanity. I am like you, and I believe that if we looked at each person as a soul without a label, we would really see the heart of each person and we would treat each other more gently with more love, tolerance, and care. Can we widen and welcome for people even though the change will make us uncomfortable? This is a safe place to have these discussions today, but I am hopeful that you will be uncomfortable by the end of this conference, that you will be uncomfortable enough to go home and do something. We want to create an environment where our needs are met, not special needs, but just needs. Everybody has needs. When we look beyond the ad appearance, into the soul of another, we recognize our connection and our individual expression of the divine. We have a realization that all of us are wonderfully made. There are many, many various religions in this room and it doesn't matter whether you talk to God, whether you talk to Allah, whether you talk to the divine, who you talk to or who you believe in, we were all wonderfully made. We have a connection with each other and there are different levels of hospitality. Accessibility is about getting into the building. Diversity is about getting invited to the table. Inclusion is about having a voice at the table. But belonging is having your voice heard. Justin Dart, the father of the Americans with Disability Rights, um, Disability Act and Disability Rights Leader said, every human being is empowered by an environment of love. Every human being is entitled to an environment of love and every human being is responsible to contribute to the environment of love. Not only in families, but also in schools, business, social services, and in our community. Imagine what it would look like if everybody was truly welcome, embraced, and belonged. And that's why we are here today, so that we can learn how to take the first steps about that. How can we create communities of belonging? And it has to be done with love. And justice is love made public. Let us pray. O oh, beloved divine of the universe, help our hearts to see the gifts of others that many don't see to open your sanctuary so that we could all receive your blessings of hope and belonging. Blessings of love so overwhelming that our cup overflows and blessings great and small fill our vessels, completing the divine picture of your universe, for without every piece no picture can be complete. And I want to thank you for being here. I want to introduce um, my partner in the planning of this conference, and that is Susan Schoenberger from Hartford Seminary.
we're going to be doing a lot of shifting around today. <laughs> be prepared. Uh, thank you, Candace, so much. Uh, my name again is Susan Schoenberger. I'm the Director of Communications here at the seminary. And we just, again, welcome you to this event. Uh, we have been so thrilled by the interest and the turnout. And um, really, we have to thank Candace again for just bringing everybody together to talk about this really important issue. Um, I'm really here to do the housekeeping part. Um, I want to make sure that everyone here feels comfortable and can um, get around the seminary. I know that we're a little tight in this room because we had um, more people come than we anticipated, but that's a good problem to have. I just hope we can all um, help each other if someone is trying to get by. Um, just do the best you can to move or assist. Um, we have an accessible, accessible bathrooms that are on this floor, right out this way. Um, but if it is tight for you in your wheelchair, if you have to um, try using the second floor, um, there's an elevator right out here as well. The second floor bathroom does not have an automatic door opener. So grab somebody and bring them with you and we'll make sure that you're able to get in and, and um, use the facilities. We have our food is here in the back. Um, I encourage anyone who needs water or coffee or tea or lemonade uh, to go ahead and get that at any point and we'll have our break to get some food um, after the keynote. So thank you so much again for coming and I am just going to quickly introduce um, the next person who will introduce our speaker. So Molly Cole, and you heard um, Joel mention her earlier, who is the Associate Director of the University of Connecticut Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, um, is the other primary person planning this event, and we have just had, you know, dozens and maybe hundreds of emails going back and forth and meetings and things to plan this. So um, I want to thank Molly and especially for the financial support of the center because without that we really could not do this event here. So uh, here's Molly. Okay, so we'll just keep moving the mic up. <laughs> So as Susan said, I am from the University of Connecticut Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. And actually the full title includes Education, Research, and Service. It's a really long title. We go by USED. That's just the way it is. We're out in Farmington, um, right across from UConn Health in the exchange across the street. You will find there a fabulous staff of people who are exceptionally well-versed in an array of issues affecting people with disabilities. Um, we do a number of projects um, across the lifespan, and one of those areas happens to be um, developing community leadership. It's a, a topic near and dear to my heart, and that's where this initiative falls. So we are excited to be working with the Hartford Seminary as a partner on this. I really want to thank them because they, um, they've sort of embraced this idea with us and uh, have been exceptionally supportive in pulling this together. So it's been um, a work of pure joy to make it happen. It was uh, something planned and thought about long before we decided to pull it off and we're really happy that you're all here. And we are really encouraged at the interest that is shown in making inclusive communities in faith communities. Um, this is about building a good life. We talk about that a lot in our work, that we're building good lives for all people, including people with disabilities, and that includes having good lives in their faith communities. That means having a chance to share, to participate, to contribute, as Candace so eloquently put it, to just belong. Um, with that, I have the absolute joy of introducing your keynote for the night. Um, Bill Caventa actually spent this morning with our staff out at the USED. Uh, he has a long history with USED, so um, I think he felt pretty comfortable being with us, and we were very happy to have a chance to spend time with him. He's currently the director of the Summer Institute on Theology and Disability, and um, he's the director of the new collaborative on faith and disability, so that's linking a number of our new sets together. 
Um, his primary areas of expertise are spiritual and faith-based supports for people with disabilities. Um, he does training for clergy, seminarians, community service staff, aging. Um, I think as we heard him speak this morning, he is really passionate about this topic, but also really passionate about connecting with all of us as people. I think you'll find that um, he has a lot to share with you this evening, and I'm not going to take any more of your time. I want to welcome Billy Rundgren. I'm always delighted to do anything connected to uh, you said. I'm also delighted when something is connected to a seminary because there are more seminaries doing things around the area of disability is better uh, than, um, than there used to be. Uh, and I've been fascinated by uh, what Hartford has been doing in terms of interfaith work because my journey over time is from being a, raised a Southern Baptist missionary kid to essentially becoming an, an American Baptist clergyman, a Protestant chaplain, and then a coordinator of religious services uh, when I began working more and more with a variety of ecumenical groups and faith traditions. And that's been even more the case in the last 20 years, I would say. I would, some of my holiest moments have come in non-Christian settings. Um, and. Uh, uh, and I, and that may be the case for you all as well in different times, but it's been, what's been fascinating in the last 10, 15, 20 years in different faith communities is that disability and inclusion and belonging has become a way for different faith traditions and all of the broadness of the Christian traditions, you know, we all don't think alike, as you well know, uh, coming to, that disability has provided a way for people to talk to each other when they might not talk to each other otherwise, or might not have the occasion to otherwise. Because the issues about supporting families, including people with disabilities, Theological questions, pastoral questions, they're no different among the different denominations or different faith traditions. And I think I would add, Candace, a little bit to what you said. In every major faith tradition, there's a struggle about how to deal with the meaning of disability and whether it's somehow related to sin or fault or somehow related to special call or is in the Islam tradition a test uh, and so, or in sometimes in Christian traditions, a specialness, uh, a holy innocent, which most of us know is not true. Uh, uh, and so there's that kind of struggle within the script. The scriptures say, as they do around other things, different things. And the question is, how do we pull out of that the core of what we think? Um, and I think the core movement is towards one of the theological tenets that every faith tradition agrees upon, which is that in the heart of every person, we are all created in the image of God. Um, and there's a wonderful saying that I thought was Christian till I found out it was Jewish that comes out of the Middle Ages that says, and imagine this for every person with a disability you know. In front of every person, there's a host of angels saying, make way for the image of God. Make way for the image of God. So if we thought that about every person, think about the ways that might make uh, accessibility and belonging uh, and our attempt to welcome and to find and see God through each person. Um, uh, make that so much more of a task of welcoming with curiosity and anticipation and not with fear or some are, are worried about things. Um, so I want to start where Candace was a little bit ago. Almost every congregation has a sign on their front lawn or their website that says what? All are welcome. Everybody welcome. Most of you are here because you've been trying to help 
all of us in whatever tradition to uh, practice what we preach and make that possible. Everybody welcome. Every kind of body welcome. Every kind of what it means to be human welcome. To feel people are welcome, included, but also hopefully in the part to fit a sense like a really belonging. So I was having breakfast, if, if uh, <coughs> President Warren was still here, I was having breakfast one morning with Dan Aylshire, who was the president of the Association for Theological Schools, who credits seminaries like this. And we were having breakfast and our purpose, my purpose was to talk with him about how we could work gently and forcefully and assertively with seminaries around getting this included in curriculum. And he told me about being invited to speak at a Baptist church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. He had gone to Southern Baptist Seminary. He was a Baptist like I was by background. And one of his colleagues had gone on to be the pastor of one of the big Baptist churches in Fredericksburg. And that particular church had gotten connected to some agency that ran a group home. And then people started coming and one thing led to another. And by now this congregation was running community residential programs, had their own kind of adult day program, and was just known as anybody here, anybody who comes is welcome. And he said, I was invited to preach and I got up that Sunday morning and went to the pulpit and looked out at the congregation and the congregation reflected that kind of diversity out there. And he said, to, he said and I said to myself, well, it's about time. The whole, every, the whole people of God finally showed up. <laughs> the whole people of God finally showed up. Like everybody, every expression of that was, were there and they were welcome. It was a Christian tradition, but it would work the same way, I think, in Muslim and in Jewish uh, understandings of what it means to be all of God's people, or the Ummah, or the people, um, or the people of God. So what would happen if all of God's people finally showed up at your congregation or any congregation on Sunday, Friday, Saturday, or whatever? And uh, not, what, not how do we invite people, but what would happen if they were showing up regularly and felt at home? I found out earlier that I didn't know Candace had been a leader of the Center for Independent Living Network. A couple of years ago, I met one of those groups from New York, and this particular Center of Independent Living had established a group of people with disabilities, with different kinds of disabilities, a small group, not too big of a group, that would show up unexpectedly in different congregations on Sunday morning. It was like a band of less than 12 spies being sent by the people of Israel across the River Jordan into the Promised Land to see what, what, you know, what this land was and would we be welcome there and would it be fruitful and would, would it be good for us. And, uh, and then they would go, they'd meet together afterwards and then they'd write up a report and send it to the congregation uh, free of charge. Uh, you know, uh, now, one might think there could have been some hostility in some of this, uh, but there, as Candace has pointed out, there have been a lot of wounds, uh, a lot of bad experiences. But think about if that happened, happened in your faith community, um, and they showed up and we were ready for them without knowing that they were coming. We were ready for anybody like that. So let's visualize that kind of faith community and let's think about where we're there. First of all, they could all get in. They could all get in. Not just get into the building, but from the parking lot, you've got curb cuts, you've got places to get into the building, you've got signs, you've got uh, parking places that are relatively close to the building so that people can there and you can get in and there are also accessible bathrooms. There was an Episcopal diocese in the Pacific Northwest that worked on inclusive ministries for a while and boiled it down to one motto. If they can't go, they won't come. <laughs> uh, in terms of the importance of accessible kinds of bathrooms. 
Uh, and so there would be the straight and easy way in. Or as Isaiah said, not crooked, but straight. <laughs> not bumpy, but smooth. Uh, the mountains pulled down and the valleys raised high. And there would be that accessible path uh, into the people of Jerusalem. Uh, and there would be pew cuffs, so people who had used chairs could sit anywhere they wanted to, not just in the back of the church or scattered around in different places. There would be loops and hearing aids easily available. We would have realized that our architecture and our building says something, proclaims something, preaches something to the community. It used to be that religious buildings were built with good intentions, with steps and different levels because the idea was that you were going up into God's presence and then once you got into the sanctuary you were also going up to an altar or so it's not it's not that people just were not thinking about people with this because you can still do that if you make it all accessible but that's where a lot of that architectural those architectural issues uh, came up but as we all know the path to good intention sometimes uh, we leave things out and what that is, it is, is a primary model of what the social model of disability says. It's the barriers of attitude and architecture that primarily disable people, not any kind of diagnosis or medical condition. It's not a diet. The barriers of the disability comes from outside by not being able to participate as much as it does from somebody's inability to participate. And we learned a lesson in this church where we were ready for all these people. We learned a lesson that when our environment became accessible, it helped all kinds of people we hadn't anticipated helping. We, uh, there was a major state university in the Midwest which made their campus accessible back in the 70s or 80s after the first one of the laws came out. The Rehab Act, I think, and said if you're getting federal funding, you have to be accessible. And then after they did that, they asked people on campus why they did it. And all the people who rode bikes said you did it for us. And all the people who had strollers or kids in strollers said you did it for us. And all the guys who delivered drinks and snacks to camp campus vending machines said you did it for us. Uh, and when it really wasn't necessarily for those folks at all. And it, when, when things are accessible and people can walk up ramps or use elevators, people with invisible, invisible disabilities like heart conditions, all kinds of things begin to happen. And there are story after story of congregations whose accessibility efforts were kind of stuck until some of the key people in their congregation got older and then couldn't come because of the physical accessibility. And then we get to the point there where we're saying we have people in our congregations who are shut at shut-ins. Are they shut in or are they shut out uh, by the barrier, not by attitudes? Uh, so that being able to come all the way in. A Jewish synagogue in, outside of Princeton, New Jersey that I worked with, was, they built a new building called a rabbi who, and they wanted him to work intentionally on inclusion. And it's an incredible plant. I mean, it's like one of those, like a hotel where you drive up under the overhang so people who get in a van and a chair won't get wet if they're getting out and can go in or anybody and just walk right in and move. You go into the sanctuary, there are no steps, no barriers, gentle slope to the sanctuary. The, the, the beam of the front has ramps around the edges of this curved sanctuary, which said people uh, realize looked like embracing arms uh, so that people could be up front and not there not long after that it enabled one of the senior members of the congregation to start coming back to synagogue services periodically and she hadn't been able to do that for years because the old place was inaccessible she died about a year later they had the service from the, the funeral from the synagogue and her children told the rabbi that what was so meaningful about all this for her mother, for their mother, was that during the Depression, she and her husband had paid the mortgage to keep the synagogue alive. And if you think about that kind of forebearer or pillar in our faith communities, 
You would want them uh, who've kept people alive. You would want them to be able to be part of that community as much as they can uh, up until the moment that they depart. It's very much like that, uh, making things accessible, like that wonderful poster that we all sit under trees that we did not plant, and we all plant seeds for trees, hopefully these days even more so, uh, than that we will never sit under or never enjoy. And if somebody showed up, we would have figured out what to do if people spoke in different languages. And by that I mean not necessarily languages other than English, but if people spoke with their hands, if people spoke with assistive hearing list, uh, speaking devices, if speak, people spoke in a needed big print to speak or to read or to listen, we would have figured that out. If we didn't, couldn't afford a regular uh, interpreter, and, and it's always, the, with, with all of these things, it's the question of the chicken or the egg. Well, we don't have people who are deaf who are coming. Well, then we don't have an interpreter. Well, if you don't have an interpreter, people who are deaf are not going to come. Um, but, but if you can do captioning, and there are teenagers who can type faster than on a cell phone than I can on a computer, and that's an easy, easy version of doing cart and captioning, which you could utilize sitting next to somebody if you really wanted to. I mean, there are ways to get about this in terms of making things to happen. Um, if people had speech impediments and the ushers had been trained to know that if somebody can't speak very clearly, that they had been trained not to feel uncomfortable, but to feel, to go and introduce themselves to that person and, if, and to be honest if they couldn't understand, but to be honest in a gentle way and say, you're trying to tell me something, I'm not getting it, keep on trying, I will eventually get it. The speech and hearing problem is in between us. It doesn't rest always on you. It's, it's in between us and we'll figure this out and I'm going to make some mistakes as the listener. Now probably after I get to know you, as you all do, for lots of people who speak <coughs> and have trouble speaking in usual ways, you know what they're saying because you've gotten used to their dialect and their words and they can, you can communicate to them. It's the same thing about being able to learn the multiple ways of talk and of speech. That's why Amos Young, one of the famous theologians in this work, talks about, and he's Pentecostal, and talks about the importance of Pentecost for the area of disability. Because at Pentecost, what happened? Everybody heard the Spirit speak to them in their own tongue. So think about what that means for people with disabilities, of all kinds of disabilities. They heard and spoke to them in their own tongue. It might be sign language, it might be through a computer, it, it, what are the different tongues? It might be symbols and pictures. What are the tongues that people use and the, the ways that we can help people know that we speak your language here? The congregation will, of course, have those large print bulletins. Uh, we know about the importance of gentle touch with people who are blind. And if you're coming up to them, not to surprise them, like, let, you, let people know you're coming. And especially not to say, let me take your elbow and take you where you want to go. But to offer that elbow in a gentle way. Or also to say, especially after you've said hello to people, to let them know you're going somewhere else so they're not left speaking in the thin air. Uh, you know, there are wonderful resources. Candace would know these to help congregations with that basic kind of disability etiquette. Uh, one of the best ones and the funniest ones is a, a, a video called The Ten Commandments for Communicating with People with Disabilities. It's a 25-minute DVD. It's old, but it's excellent and it's humorous. Uh, it uses humor and helps people look and laugh at each other. And that's one of the things we need in all this, in inclusion. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to make mistakes and we better learn to laugh with each other. Uh, and to, and to re realize that we're not going to get it right sometimes. Um, and that's the, and there's a real importance because I know some people with disabilities with wicked senses of humor. They've had to develop that to deal with typical people. And, uh, and, and, uh, like the guy who was asked, 
He got tired of people coming up to him. He was a guy in a wheelchair. He was tired of people coming up to him saying, my brother, you could, if your faith was strong enough, you could be healed. He got tired of that and finally shot back to the guy, next guy who said to him that, my brother, if your faith was strong enough, you could cure me. <laughs> And that is more true to the New Testament than the other. Because in John 9, that split between, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's the split certainly between sin and disability. You just cut that thing. And here's an opportunity to show and experience God's love and God's grace and God's glory. Now we get into the weeds. We would have gotten much more conscious of the unspoken rules about behavior in our congregation, in our community. What the autism world calls the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum. You don't know what those rules are until you break them, or someone else does. When did you first go to a faith community that was very different from your own tradition? How many of you didn't know what to do when? I grew up in Southern Bags. When I started going to Catholic Masses in my work, I was a very liturgically impaired worship tenor. I didn't know when to sit or kneel. I didn't know which way this went. You know, all those, those kinds of things. And you, you, just, you just don't know. And you want to get things right. You want to learn those things. Whereas for other people, it's just, you've grown up in it. It's just part of your blood. Um, so we decided as a congregation, we're going to be explicit about that. Here's what we did. Sometimes, occasionally, we offered before, not on a Sunday, but on a Friday or Saturday or whatever, an opportunity for anybody interested in our congregation to come to the sanctuary and we'd sort of talk them through the service. Let them come in and get used to the building and where the bathrooms are, and, uh, and especially the people from a group home who might want to come. You don't come first thing Sunday morning for the first time, but let people know what's going to happen. Uh, get people kind of used to the surroundings, just like Susan was doing that for us. We became more aware uh, for the importance of some people, especially people with autism, of our regular liturgy. And we all, whether or not we think we do, are congregations that have a fairly regular liturgy. We might not call it that. We think we're not a liturgical congregation. But I grew up Southern Baptist. I would, they would say, oh, we're not liturgical. Well, you are. You do it the same way. You, you've certainly got routines. And you do it the same way. We've got a structure, a format, a flow. And for lots of people, not just people with autism, that's very important. Just ask any pastor who's trying to change the order of service <laughs> and didn't ask their worship committee or whatever and did that and the kind of feedback or the flack you get about that. So the question, and some people with autism, I've heard like with Catholic priests, if they do something different, they'll correct the priest and you know, get, them to get back on task. Uh, but that routine, that, rit that ritual is just so important as, as for us in a variety of ways. And to our many friends with intellectual and developmental disabilities, we've done some good thinking and we realize that faith does not equate with reason and understanding. That it, your faith does not equate with reason and understanding. We say to have faith in Jesus doesn't mean you have to know all the theological doctrines about Jesus. We say to have a personal faith. We say to be part of the Jewish community. You need to know the specialness of that and to go through a bar or bat mitzvah and do and speak about your devotion in a way that you can. And the same way with the Islam, Muslim traditions of, of initiation into a community. Um, if faith did equate with intellectual understanding, a whole lot of us would be in trouble. Uh, Roman Catholic survey about three years ago that asked Roman Catholics what communion meant, and over 50% of them got it wrong uh, in terms of what the official teaching was uh, about that. So we thought through how to make our services more participatory, use of movement, varied senses, hearing, sound, sight, smells perhaps, uh, not just relying upon the heard and spoken word. 
We would have discarded that old question about communion. Do they know what, can they understand what communion is uh, to be part of that? Because all they would really need to understand is not an intellectual understanding. It's about being belonging at the table and belonging and believing in Jesus and the Christian tradition and wanting to be there. When I was a six-year-old and walked down the aisle to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I had no intellectual idea about what I was doing. I was saying I was wanting to be part of the adult church. I want to be part of this group. And my understanding came later. And I can tell you, though, from story after story after story of about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who can tell you the doctrines about community but could tell you, and from those experiences, something about the holiness of it to them. One of my favorite stories is from the UK. It was a guy, a kid with autism, who was being trained for his first communion service, for confirmation. And the bishop came one Sunday before that service happened. And if you have not been through that ritual, if you go through the line of the communion service, you're supposed to cross your arms and receive a blessing uh, from, the, from the bishop or whoever is doing the service. This kid with autism got up to the bishop, crossed his arms, and said, um, what is this? You're just stingy. <laughs> <laughs> You've got all those Jesuses in you, and you won't give me one. Uh, you've got, and, and when he was, when he finally did get uh, confirmed and he was part of that, and the bishop did that, you know, this, this is a kid for whom getting to participate in communion was the thing he was most looking forward to in that faith community. And that, you know, and it was just a radical statement about inclusion and his being part of that version of the body of Christ. After he was confirmed, the celebration was immense. We would have prepared for, and we prepared for, sometimes with great enjoyment, the fact that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who haven't had a lot of experience in the congregations and learned all the hidden curriculum would answer the rhetorical questions that the pastor asked during the sermon. <laughs> You know, would probably say back to the pastor something that half of the congregation wanted to say. Uh, uh, our pastor, one pastor said, I know when somebody's doing that, that somebody does that, at least somebody's paying attention. Uh, a young girl with Down syndrome who was getting confirmed went to the front with her mom and they went through the questions about being confirmed and the pastor said to the young girl do you love Jesus and she said yes and do you know Jesus loves you and she said yes and he asked another question and the young girl turned to her mother and said do I have to get a physical for this too <laughs> so you know you never know what's going to come out uh, and kind of ways of seeing things that illuminate and in fact teach us something about uh, what it means to be a person of faith. Uh, there was my friend Anna at the services we used to do at our center in Rochester. We had churches come and help us on Sunday afternoons to do the service at the center. because we want, I wanted my folks there to know that church meant being with more people. It was not about the institutionalized population. It was about being with a wider group of people. And we'd have pastors come and do a 10 minute kind of sermon or whatever. And a Presbyterian pastor came in and did kind of a typical Presbyterian teaching sermon for 10 minutes. And my friend Anna got up right after he finished and he stood up and said, Now I want to tell you something. Uh, you know, just, but you know, you just, those kinds of things uh, would be one, one pastor, I know pastors who've got to where they just take it in stride. One pastor who had a group of people coming from a nursing home. And if you've got a group of people from a nursing home, maybe with partial dementia or whatever, in an area at the front of the church so they can be close, there's going to be some noises or some sounds <laughs> occasionally, just like there are with kids. And one Sunday that started to happen, and the pastor says, don't worry a bit. What you hear are the sounds of community. Uh, what you hear are the sounds of community are the 
the mom with a daughter with Down syndrome who had a visiting pastor one Sunday was preaching and her daughter started to act out. This is in our Autism and Faith book from New Jersey. One of my favorite stories. And a visiting pastor asked her to take her daughter out. Um, and the pastor heard about that. The mom got the courage to come back. It started to happen again. The pastor said, she started to get up and said, sit down. It's our, it's our need to figure out how to do this. You just stay here and we'll figure this out. Think about the difference uh, in that kind of response. To go with the flow and to take those kinds of moments and just weave them into the beauty uh, and, the, and the holiness of, the, of that. And then probably the scariest thing for lots of people, we had worked out our welcome and belonging for people with mental illness. We had figured that out. That whose thirst for community and support and safe places called on us to learn how to balance kindness and welcome with boundaries, uh, to balance the needs of the one with the many. Like the congregation that figured out that their friend John, who came and during the time for offering prayer concerns, could some Sunday start and go on for 10 or 15 minutes if the pastor had left them. And what did they do? They finally figured out with the deacons and made this and then talk with John about this and they said John we know on Sundays some Sundays you come with a lot in your heart and on some of those Sundays if you have a lot to say we want you to say a little bit to the congregation and then one of us is going to come down and tap you on the shoulder and we'll go back into the lobby because we want to hear the rest of what you've got to say to let the people let the people go on with the service a way of teaching what are in respectfulness about the needs of the one and the many and balancing uh, kind of and teaching people what are those kind of hidden curriculum kinds of things in faith communities a catholic minister pastor in somerville new jersey had a number of street people coming to his mass occasionally and one sunday the doors flung open and the front of the parish and a guy came walking down the aisle saying I am Jesus I am Jesus and you can imagine that everybody froze and started trying to call their local behavior therapist call out of the police uh, or what thought about doing that and Father John who was behind the altar at that point as the guy got close to the front Father John stepped out from behind the altar went towards the guy, held out his hand and said, welcome, we've been expecting you. <laughs> Which totally diffused the situation. You know, if the guy had been expecting an argument or a confrontation, it just totally, he said, have a seat, we're gonna go on with the service. And then began to deal with other things later. So we gradually began to figure out ways to deal with what the stuff we call challenging behavior in the, in the disability world. Um, Truth be told, any pastor can name to you any number of congregants whose behavior is challenging. Uh, so we don't, that's not something we want just to hang upon the shoulders and the ID cards of people with disabilities. But we learn that we, if we observe carefully about kids who get upset, we can figure out what happens before they get upset and we can figure out maybe what they want. What are they trying to get? What do they not like? Is it a way of saying I'm bored? You know, do we need lots of fidgety stuff in our pews for kids to fidget with? Barbara Newman and the organization Belong got that stuff nailed down. They just got all kinds of good fidgety things that you can get. And people to do that. Lots of adults need fidgety things. Um, um, but we can teach teachers to learn to look at that behavior and help direct people towards teach people what's more appropriate in that we call it positive behavior supports in the system and there are sunday school teachers who would love to learn how to use what's called positive behavior supports with all of their kids not just with the kids with autism a way of discipline and a way of keeping order that doesn't rely upon the rule of the stick or the, the fear or the shut up kind of thing now, to take that even a step further, Tom Reynolds, who's one of the best theologians in this area, is in Toronto. 
is the father of a young man with psychiatric and developmental issues, autism. Tom's, who's, and he's had a lot of, his, his son's had lots of behavioral kinds of things and dealt, they dealt with them in multiple systems. He said, at the, one of our summer institutes, he said, can we learn how to interpret provocation as invocation? Think about it. Can we learn to interpret something that's provocative, that provokes us in our service, as an invocation, a request to do something different or to have something else available? Not always we can't do that because we never know what people are bringing with them. But does that kind of challenging thing become an opportunity for us to look at ways that uh, we can, that people want something different? I've heard too many stories about people from group homes coming and the whole group home sitting on the group home pew. And what happens? The arguments that were happening at breakfast will keep right on through the service, just like it sometimes happens in the congregation or our family. And you get into shh, no, shh. You get into, you know, it starts just escalating. And what do you do there? Pretty simple. I don't want to sit with the same people all the time. You know, can we find people who could get to know the people out of sheer interest and have them sit with people around the congregation? So it's not like brothers or sisters who's teenagers argue with each other all during the service from the same family, but they sit with people that are getting to know people and they're quiet because this is kind of fun and this is kind of this is kind of new. So we've explored that hidden curriculum stuff. Uh, when somebody staff from a group home called and said we'd like to start coming, we did the thing about coming before Sunday or Saturday or Friday so we can teach people what it's like to kind of go through a service. And, and then when somebody said to us, well, see, maybe they don't understand what they're supposed to do. Maybe they don't understand. We've, we've helped, we learned to be able to say to people, they have not had the years of experience and practice that you and I have had. I grew up a Southern Baptist missionary kid. Went to Baptist boarding school. I went through devotions in church more times a week than I ate. Just, not, not really, but you know. And if you did it again and again and again until you got it. It's in your blood. If you're Roman Catholic, you know that. If you're parts of other traditions, you know that. You don't have to think about it. You just, it's part of it. You do it. That means practice. Opportunities to practice over and over again. And we, we then may need to think about figuring out ways for adults to get that kind of practice and for people to model. And finally, we learned that people have got to learn the culture of our congregation in some ways, while we also got to look at the culture and say, are our boundaries God's boundaries? And do we need to maybe think about lightening up about some stuff or figuring out some ways to do this? Fred Craddock was one of the best uh, preacher homiletics professors there ever was. One of the best preachers there ever was. His wife and my, my wife and he grew up in the same congregation in, East Tennessee, in West Tennessee. Fred was about this tall. He had a uh, voice like a shrimp. Uh, just very, but he was an incredible preacher, incredible preacher. And I heard him once at Princeton Seminary say, just because we say that everybody's welcome does not mean that anything goes. Just because that everybody's welcome doesn't mean that anything goes. And so we, we, if somebody's really doing stuff time and time again to kind of the, that's making it really difficult for people to see the person behind that, then you've got to figure out ways to work on that. And don't just shut the door, but figure out ways to work on that and what, what's going on and what and perhaps help people to look to learn. Because most people that I've known with disabilities really sometimes it's their anxiety about being accepted that causes them to kind of act out in different ways. There was like a congregation who got really mad at the young man who had the kind of a fetish for young women's shoes and he'd want to say, can I look at your shoes? And the young women began to think that that was 
some kind of excuse to get down and look, look up their skirts. And they then, you know what happened? You know, the fears and the stereotypes just blossomed and there's this sex, you know, pervert or whatever going on. And they started thinking about calling in the experts. What needed to happen was for that church to find some other young men to get to know that guy. And if that happened, for one of those guys to say, cut it out. Uh, we don't do that as men here in this congregation. That's just not something we do. That kind of peer, one-to-one, -one, just you know better than that. This is just not uh, that kind of, in Thessalonians and the Christian Bibles, how do we admonish one another with some kindness and with love? and help the teach people. So if God's people, all of God's people showed up, we'd have quite a community. Uh, we would have realized that not everybody is alike here, or that we're all homogeneous. Even if we all are the same race, we're not all the same. Uh, if we thought we were all the same, and we forgot about the fight that happened on the Board of Trustees last week, or, or other kinds of things happened. No, we've learned to look for what Thomas Merton called the hidden holiness underneath all this diversity. And that diversity is something about all of us being created in God's image. Uh, Thomas Merton, that sense about that hidden oldness came to him in that moment of revelation at the corner of Broadway and Fourth in Louisville, when he as a monk was walking through the city and all of a sudden he had this flashing revelation that he was connected to everybody else in this intersection. And it was that sense of we are connected in those kinds of ways. And we maybe have gotten the uh, poet's Ken Paxton's words up in a congregation to a uh, poster to celebrate kind of the wonderfulness and the spiciness of diversity and the way of difference kind of helps us to keep our eyes open and ears open and seeing how people are different. Ken Paxton said, any God who created elephants and Eskimos must have had two or three kids of his own. <laughs> You know, think about the diversity of faith communities. Think about the diversity in the city of restaurants. Mm -hmm. Think about how bereft you might feel if you didn't have all those different places you might want to go to now. And unfortunately, as you know, we're at a time where people are scared to death of diversity. And it's just, uh, they're just, re we're, 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 we're at a really tough time. Because if we were all the same, it would really be, to tell the truth, boring. All of us like to learn things in ways that we learn things from people who are different and from places who are different. And we want to be able to feel safe and welcome if we go to another country. How do we do the same thing? So we had visitors who came to us and said, this is pretty amazing. You guys do this pretty well. And they say, how'd you do that? How'd you get there? Which consultant did you invite in to help do all this? Uh, which book or expert? Did you read Bill Gavetta's book? Uh, and if we are honest, we might say, no, we didn't. There wasn't any. We just learned to say over a cup of coffee to a family or to a person uh, afterwards at some point, we might not have it, but tell us what you need to be part of the field of the care, part of this congregation. Tell us what you need, and we'll work it on it and figure it out. Some things worked and some things didn't. Didn't work for everybody. But here are some of the things we learned over time. The first part of welcoming is listening. Listen, listen, listen. And especially if you're welcoming people who've had bad experiences with churches in the past or synagogues or, or mosques, be prepared for some anger at some point. Because those are wounding experiences that they carry and they're going to have to be able to trust you to say why they are so anxious. And, and the trust that you can hear it and not get defensive. Uh, start one by one at a time. Just do it one by one. You don't need a program to start. Uh, David Brooks from the New York Times calls the people who do that, work with people, the weavers of our community. How do you weave people into the fabric of our congregations and communities? The pastor can't do it all and usually doesn't, but he or she can model and can bless and can preach about it. And model and bless and preach. We learn that we can connect people by what they're interested in beyond their faith tradition of learning about faith. 
So that if we have a guy who comes, or a woman who comes to the church, and there's a woman with cerebral palsy who perhaps loves opera, but has never gotten to go to an opera, we go looking for somebody in our congregation who loves opera too, and try to connect them. Because then they've got a shared passion that connects them, under which the disability would make a little difference. Uh, and then that person in the congregation who loves opera has a strength and a capacity to give and to, and to do that. Eric Carter's got the great story about this I used this morning. They tried to get a bunch of guys in their congregation to go become visitors and friends to a bunch of guys who lived in a new group home. They put a bulletin, they had the bulletin, people who show up after church, nobody showed up after church. About two months later, they put a bullet, an ad in the bullet and said, all the guys, this is in Madison, Wisconsin, all the guys who are Packers fans, if you'd be interested in getting together with other Packer fans on Sunday afternoons and watching football together and maybe having a beer or two, would you like to do that through the church? 50 people showed up. And then they said to them, by the way, we're going to do this with four guys who are Packer fans. Uh, we live in this group home and some of us are going to involve them and we may go there or whatever. We're going to involve this in this. Because they never get a chance to be with other Packer fans or do that with other people. And if you're a Packer fan, or a Patriot fan, God forbid, or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. I wanted to see if you're awake. But if you're a Packer fan, the tragedy is not that they have a disability. The tragedy is they don't get to be with other Packer fans. That's the tragedy. And, you know, and so you, you figure out a way. We can, give, we can help them learn about Packer. We can help them learn about what it means to be a Packer fan. We started looking for everybody's gifts and we figured out how to use them. The quickest way to inclusion and belonging in a congregation is to see what people's gifts they have and what they would like to do in the congregation and put them to work. So other people can see people doing, acting and living out their faith in that community. And if we can't find a job for them in the congregation, it doesn't say anything about their ability. It says something about our creativity. We can figure it out, even if it's one of the most simple things to do. Um, and it can be more than usher. Just all kinds of, what are the little tasks that it takes to get to know a congregation? If you know, uh, I'll come back and I'll remember it later on. We began to realize the huge power of any rite of passage in a faith community to build community. And we work with people with disabilities and intellectual development disabilities to help them learn to the best of their ability to participate in that. Then, who came to that rite of passage? All of their teachers, all of their relatives, the whole community who had been there, and it became a way for that whole community to celebrate again in a new way what that ritual means in that faith community. It became so much to them. Of a community thing. I got a call once from a mom uh, who was Baptist. Her son with Down syndrome had wanted to be baptized in the church, and the pastor said, with all good intentions, oh, he doesn't need to be baptized, he's already in. It's the whole holy innocence stuff, you know, and it, the pastor just missed the point. He wanted to be baptized, and they, they, she couldn't get it. Finally, she got an associate pastor to do a baptism, but it wasn't during the regular service. Mm -hmm. Like with them. And so they did the baptism in the pool with people around. This guy, Keith, comes out of the water and, and comes out and people look and say, look at that ring that's around the pool. Of course, the water goes up and it goes back down and things are ring. And this young man with Down syndrome and the best of Baptist theology said, that's my sin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the best of Baptist theology. The tragedy there was that the whole congregation didn't hear that. You know, and what a difference that would have made uh, to, to them, to those persons. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie Praying with Lior, um, about a Jewish young boy, Lior, Jewish, who has got a gift of leading people in Jewish form of prayer, uh, and his bar mitzvah, get it. Uh, and lend it around and show it. It's just an incredible piece uh, about um, the power of inclusion and inclusive rituals. 
And we kept going back to rituals, uh, kept going back to the scriptures and teachings of our tradition to understand what we were doing and why we were doing it. And as our arms got wider, our faith went deeper as we started asking deeper questions. And we started learning that when we welcome a stranger who may have a disability, that really it was the stranger doing us a favor, not the host doing them so much a favor. They were bringing, like in the Bible, bringing God to us through the stranger. And then we began to realize how many leaders in our biblical and scriptural traditions had some of disability, or limit, form of disability or limitation. Moses, Isaac, Jacob, Elisha, Solomon, women who were bearing the barren, the worst disability in biblical times. A woman who was barren was the worst stigma uh, in biblical times. David, hyperactive, who's always dancing, uh, you know, uh, and doesn't do deal with boundaries very well. Uh, <laughs> Jeremiah, people thought he was crazy. Isaiah's servant, Elisha, who wanted to kill himself. Uh, the blind man who taught Muhammad once when Muhammad tried to shoo away the blind man. Paul and the thorn in my, whatever the thorn in my side is. Um, Isaac, there are people who thought, think Isaac might have been uh, intellectually disabled because he never says anything. Uh, There's some Jewish people who think that. Uh, Jacob and his limp. Um, so uh, Solomon was depressed. You know, so you, you look and you begin to realize. And so it was not that these are people who were leaders because they were perfect people. It was because the way that they coped with their lives, now I don't want to say it's because of the disability of their leader. That's not what either. It's the way they get, they, they, people saw them coping and dealing with the people and the way in which then they said, in this person we see a leader and one of God's chosen and one of God's favorites. Uh, in that they saw them then as holy men and as leaders. So it's it's about how people integrate and include our, our limitations. Um, and we discover time and time again that our limits are maybe our strengths, and our strengths, some of our strengths are our limits. Um, paradoxes of faith. Are we there yet as a perfect congregation? No, we've still got dreams. Uh, there are promises in God's kingdom that haven't been met. But we've learned um, by the journey as God's people of whatever stripe that we're becoming the people that God has called us to be. Because whatever form the image of God shows up in our congregation, he or she is going to be welcome and we'll figure it out. Thank you. One of my vulnerabilities and limitations is that I'm a Baptist preacher. Uh, we've, we've got time for maybe a question or two, but and then we'll get to some other questions in the panel. But uh, does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask right now? And you can come and ask me for supper. Well, I'm not going to stand between you and the food. <laughs> Learn that, uh, learn that especially. So the food is in the back. We'll ask you to go through, come back, come back to your tables. And during your conversation with tables, get to know each other. I would, if we had time, I'd want to know why you came to this. Why you came to What brought you here? And what are you, what are you hoping to do? So it's good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat.
your attention, please? Thank you. May I have your attention, please? We're going to go ahead. I kind of try to keep this on time a little bit. Um, we appreciate everybody's patience in our various activities um, for making things accessible. We all needed our exercise. Um, we're going to start off with the second part of the conference, which is a panel discussion. And I'm not sure where everybody's sitting, so I'm just going to go down my list. We have Deacon Dennis Ferguson from the Church of St. Timothy in West Hartford. Right here in the Pitan, we have Lynn Johnson down on the corner who is a pastoral psychotherapist at a Quaker who attends Emmanuel Congregational Church. We have Amy Langston, who is an alumni here at Hartford Seminary, and she came tonight from Raleigh, uh, South Carolina. North. <laughs> North Carolina. And we have... <laughs> North. <laughs> North, get it right. <laughs> You know why? I've changed that on my computer a million times and it insists that Raleigh is in South Carolina, so I'll just go with it. <laughs> <laughs> go with the following. Um, over here I have Kathleen Ludlam, who is an advocate, our third speaker. She's from Manchester. And here I have my good friend Ida Monsour, who is coordinator, a coordinator, coordinator, you give me a coordinator? <laughs> you know what it's like. <laughs> coordinator of Islamic chaplaincy program here at Hartford Seminary. Uh, Hartford Seminary. <laughs> you know what, let me tell you about myself a little bit. I have a traumatic brain injury, and you've heard of sundowns for people with Alzheimer's. Well, I get that at night. So by 8 o'clock, don't talk to me. <laughs> um, and down on the next to the end, I have Erica Thompson, who is my pastor. I'm telling you that in case she tells you later that she doesn't know me. I'm telling you that. <laughs> that she's senior pastor of a Sodom Hill Congregational Church. And I'm very excited to have this group of people together. We will be, uh, I have a timekeeper someplace <coughs> over there for the panel, pay attention panel. Um, the first question, we have about 10 minutes for the panel to answer the question or talk about their journey. And then we will have about five minutes for each person to talk about the second question. Then we will have a few minutes for questions right before our group break up. Okay. And I want to say when we have our group break out, I would like for this table, the back table, to go into the chapel, which is just right across. You just go out that door and you keep going, you run into the chapel. And Amy will be your facilitator for that. And then I would like to have this table right here go into the library, which is out that way and straight that way. And Kathy will be your facilitator. And you have to watch the time because um, 8 o'clock is the bedtime for some people. So we want to be finished. Okay. Um, for the breakout groups, you might think about who you want to have report out. So I'm going to want you to take notes and then when you come back you will report out and ship. Okay? Alright. We're ready to go. For our first question on the panel, I want the panelists to talk about your journey, either as a clergy, 
trying to embrace diversity or as a disabled person seeking justice within the faith community. We'll start with Kathy. Yes. It's not going to wear the light to come around this side. Up again. And then you go. Thank you. Well, um, good evening. Um, my spiritual journey has encompassed several traditions. But for the last 25 years, I have embraced Judaism. That is going to be the perspective that I'm bringing to you today. But of course, that doesn't make sense unless I start at the beginning. Um, my parents were amazing. Um, although they were not religious, I owe much of my success, coping strategies, and ethics to their example. They were not only Protestant, and I was already using a wheelchair before the time came for me to start Sunday school around the age of five. So naturally, they chose a church that had only one step, and that was the Lutheran church. Not my name, huh? No, I'm not going to get a little bit closer. I'm not going to hit you. No, it's okay. Um, except that I can't see. So you want to show me a step? No, no, no. Sure, sorry. Sorry, I can't do it without jumps. Okay. Yeah. If I do it without jumps, I'm going to have to And I'm going to stay short, I can't stay on those. Um, so they chose a church that had only one step, and that was the Lutheran church. Interestingly, it was only the Sunday school that had one step. The sanctuary, was on the second floor. <laughs> so I was interested in what Bill said earlier that Paul was trying to get higher. And that's good, but it wasn't good for me. But um, at that time, this wasn't that important. Um, my parents wanted me to have a religious education, but they did not feel the need for us to be part of the larger church community. My quest for a deeper spiritual experience led me to a more dynamic and personal form of Christianity at age 14. That was my home for almost 20 years. Uh, my experience there was really good. I was welcomed into a church. The people there were very kind and accepting. I had to be carried in my wheelchair up and down the four front steps every Sunday. And they eagerly did this for years until they finally added a ring. My interest in Judaism started around the same time I embraced Christianity. The two traditions are so deeply linked that it was difficult for me to study one without studying both. It was for that reason that I started taking Hebrew in high school. As much as I appreciated my experience as a Christian, I always felt like there was something missing. Shabbat, the Jewish Sabbath, Passover, Sukkot, all the Jewish holidays. I wanted to celebrate all of them and to experience keeping kosher and the rich tradition of prayer. In my early 30s, I realized that my true home was within Judaism, and I began the conversion process. 
there's a lot I can say about that and about the challenges of converting and about different obstacles that I ran into within that process. It actually took me 10 years to complete my conversion. And it spanned two different denominations and three different rabbis. Um, I won't go into lots of detail because again, we'll be going on. But, um, but some of the observations that I can make about um, the different faith communities of the Naparna, over my 57 years, I've been part of seven faith communities. Some of that was because of the switching around that I have done. But for someone like me, with a mobility disability, architecture really is at the forefront for me. If I cannot get into the building, I can't participate. Likewise, if I can only be in certain parts of the building, I can only have certain parts of the experience. Like the Lutheran Church, with the sanctuary upstairs, I am going to go to the synagogue where the social hall was downstairs, or the classrooms were upstairs. Many buildings were built years ago, so this is sort of understandable. What aggravates me and other disability rights advocates is when a brand new building is created without taking the participation of all people into account. Most people think that the Americans with Disabilities Act fix this, but that's not entirely true. A lot of people don't realize that before the ADA was passed, all the major religions got together and lobbied Congress for an exemption, arguing that religious entities would do the right thing and did not need a law. This was a mistake. <laughs> As a result, many congregations are still struggling now to retrofit the inaccessible buildings they inherited. It's not so hard to build a religious building accessible from the start. What has been more challenging to me is to create accessibility for community events that happen at people's homes. I enjoy being invited to our Passover Seder and other religious meals. Many people at my synagogue told me they would like to have me over. But most houses, especially single family homes and condominiums, are still designed with sticks. The concept of visitability, where all new houses in the city are built with a minimum standard of accessibility, has unfortunately not taken home yet in Connecticut. And I'm running out of time, but I want to just say a couple of other points. People with invisible disabilities have an especially hard time. You can look at me and you already have some idea of what I mean. But, for example, a social hall can be a noisy and uncomfortable place for people with sound sensitivities. When renovating acoustic tile in the top ceiling can make the space tolerable, while its absence can make it unbearable. So regardless of what religion we are talking about, there are many things we can do to make our violence and programs more welcoming. I guess I run out of time. So I have to have to work interaction and work questions. Thank you.
Okay, all right, I'll do your turn to answer the question. Okay. Okay. Is this on? Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, so um, when I. All of you on the panel need to move the mic. Closer. Okay, can everyone hear me now? Oh. All right, it's really a pleasure to speak to all of you, and I really have to thank Candice Lowe for opening my eyes to a lot, uh, um, you know, in terms of just making this space and my, my house of worship more open. Um, I have to say that when I was a young mother, uh, I had a three-year-old, um, and I, I'm not sure if many, many people can identify with this, but usually, you know, when, when kids turn three, the, our town had this birthday party. Uh, and it was just basically to observe the children and see how they were doing. And I never realized, and she was my first child, I never realized that when anything was up with her, but I realized when, when she was in a group that she tended to be on her own. And I never had realized this before. She, was, she could read well, she was you know, very communicative, um, but she was very sensitive to sound um, and touch. And she would hug profusely, but she would she would be very sensitive about clothing and those kinds of things. And I remember just realizing that when she was three, uh, and then of course um, teachers coming up to me and saying, "Well, you know, she really needs to be in a special ed program." And that's when I first realized it. So, and, and at that same time, I was considering a Sunday school for my daughter as well. And so what I did, she, she would be having a para when she was in school. So I went to the principal of our Sunday school and I said, um, you know, Yasmin, she's, she has autism. And the first thing the principal said was, she will be welcome here. And that made all the difference to me. She also said that, is there anything that you need? And I, and I, as a new mother, wasn't sure, but I knew my daughter. And I said, is it possible for me to be the para? And she said, of course. And she was just so welcoming. And I have to say, I've never been to Sunday school, but this time in my life, but this forced me to attend Sunday school, being a para at my child's class. So I started in pre-K. And actually, I went all the way through to 11th grade <laughs> with her, making sure she was okay. I started as a para, and then I actually became a main teacher um, in the Sunday school. And I still teach. She, she graduated years ago, but I still am teaching that 11th, 12th grade. Um, I'm still there today. Um, but I have to say, just having that experience with her and having that positive feedback from someone who is a principal in the Sunday school made all the difference to me. Uh, and also being aware about certain sensitivities. So for instance, um, she's very sensitive to sound. So just the, if the mic is turned up a little bit, it can affect her. And so just having a, the knowledge of having a quiet room in the mosque where she could go to if she needed to also made a huge, huge difference to me. Our prayers are very, very structured, and we stand shoulder to shoulder. Um, and sometimes I'm, I'm a little nervous. I was a little nervous when she was young because she may not like the person standing next to her. And so I was always aware. And, and the nice thing was that people in the congregation came, you know, came to know her, and they were also very aware. So one thing she hated was little babies who had colds because, you know... <laughs> And I would always see, and, and, and someone would say, you know, she has a cold, you know, we want to move her down, down uh, you know, sort of one down the line. So they were always very, very supportive of that. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention very quickly is um, in terms of, uh, even in terms of the space that we have for our kids, I know a lot of times the imam will say, you know, he requires quiet, right? And I'm, I'm a, as a parent, I'm very, very nervous of that because I realize that my child might suddenly have a tantrum or something. Now, now she wouldn't. If you see her now, please don't mention this. <laughs> but as a child, she may have had a tantrum or something. And I was always very nervous if she would speak out, uh, out loud. Um, and I remember talking to the imam and he, him saying, I, I understand. And just him knowing made a huge, huge difference. So now, um, you know, sort of, I, I realize now I was the only para in, in the school when I started, but I realize now after 20 years now, 24 years, uh, we have teachers who are so tuned in. We have special trainings for our teachers to be more, you know, to give more accommodations to, to people who need it. And I think that makes such a difference. Um, so what else did I want to say? So in terms of, um, 
the other things that uh, I was aware of, I, I noticed that you know, as parents, when we first get a diagnosis of autism, it's it's really hard because you know we we aren't prepared. And so what, one of the things that we want to do is also uh, give support to other parents who are going through this. And I think that's really, really important. Uh, and to have circles of support, um, I think, is, is vital. Um, and so one of the things that um, I wanted to bring you uh, sort of to mind was there's this new or this organization that was founded, I think, in 2013 called Mohsin. And Mohsin really means it's, it's one who shows excellence and compassion. And uh, the, these letters, it's M-U-H-S-E-N, Muslims Understanding and Helping Special Education Needs. And this is an organization, they have a website, you know, um, so please you know, have a look at that. But they have certain standards and they give accreditation to schools uh, or, or mosques actually that are to a certain standard. And I just wanted to read you a few things that they had on there very, very quickly. So they have like a gold standard, a silver standard, a platinum standard. And one of the things that I thought when I saw this, because I saw this re most recently, is I'm going to work, I'm going to give myself a deadline and try and go to the silver standard by the end of the year. And a few things that I wanted to mention that they, they sort of um, recommend. So wheelchair accessibility, we have that. Uh, so if you come to the Berlin Mosque, you will see that. Uh, we've added ramps um, in the mosque that helps uh, for wheelchair accessibility. We have an elevator that actually works, <laughs> which is great. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, uh, they also suggested having a needs assessment survey of the community, and I think, think that's vital. I actually downloaded that needs assessment, and it actually talks to it, it. You know, we're supposed to send it to the congregation, and questions are: you know, did you feel welcome when you came here? What was your experience? And it really gives feed feedback. So, I mean, that's one of the things that I think we all can do is send a survey out to the people who attend our houses of worship and say, what are your needs? How can we make it more welcoming? Uh, I think that's a vital thing to have. Um, they have a lot of things. And I, and I, I think, I'll, you know, if you look at the website, I don't want to take too much time because I know I am. Um, but I, I really think that, that a certification program is something that would help because there's a certain standard and you want to get there. Um, so I would, I would end with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, I'm uh, Dennis Ferguson. In, in terms of my faith journey, uh, as a Irish Catholic uh, growing up in a large family, uh, six kids, uh, we went to church every Sunday. I then went off to college, to a Catholic college, and after a year as a college student, I transferred uh, to the seminary, uh, the Franciscans in Pennsylvania, St. Francis College. The TORs, we wore black habits uh, with shoes instead of the brown and sandals, which in Pennsylvania, in Allegheny, Allegheny country, shoes make sense during the winter out there. Uh, I lasted two years at the seminary and decided it wasn't for me, so I, uh, I left and uh, then went on a sabbatical, uh, probably about 25 years of not going to church. <laughs> Uh, when my daughter was born, my wife said to me, I think it's time that you came back. And uh, I did. I returned. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, the vocation bit me again, and I entered the, uh, the seminary for the Roman Catholic diaconate. <coughs> Excuse me. In the Catholic Church, as opposed to the Protestant Church, there were three ranks of uh, of clergy, ordained, uh, ordained clergy who receive the sacrament of holy orders. It's the bishop, the priest, and the deacon. I understand that is not the same in some of the Protestant churches. The deacon has a different role in, the, in many of the Protestant churches. I do all of the sacraments with the exception of consecration of mass and uh, the sacrament of reconciliation. So I baptize, bury, uh, cover the full gamut of the other sacraments. What happened a couple of years, well, eight years ago, uh, I was assigned to St. Timothy Parish in West Hartford. During that, during that in interval before, uh, while I was on sabbatical, I, uh, I worked for what was then the Department of Mental Retardation, now Department of Development and Disabilities. And we used gestural language uh, with many of our clients. It's a very primitive uh, uh, 
manual language, uh, not dissimilar uh, to American school for uh, American sign language. When I got to St. Tim's, um, they had a deaf community there and an interpreted mass every, every Sunday. Prior to uh, that, there had been a Catholic priest and a Roman Catholic nun who for 30 years, for three generations, ministered to deaf Catholics here. Monsignor Bergen died in 2008, and shortly after that, uh, we, we developed a, uh, the deaf ministry at St. Tim's with an interpreter. Uh, the interpreter, Julie Colbert, uh, is Jewish. And it was always a delight to have a Jewish woman saying the words of consecration when we had a deaf priest who was celebrating. Uh, but in any event, that prompted me to get back involved in, in, in a ministry uh, similar to the, uh, the, uh, the gestural language. When uh, Bergen died, as they say, in 2008, Monsignor Bergen, there was nothing in the archdiocese for six years. There was no ministry at all. Um, Archbishop Blair came in in 2014. I set him up with meeting some of my deaf parishioners. He made a vow that, in fact, we would have a deaf ministry. Uh, and as I was telling Bill at lunch, you know, you don't open your mouth in front of the Archbishop because then you get appointed to be the director of the office. <laughs> but in any event, we, um, my, my experience with the, with the deaf is uh, that it is a, uh, a real culture. Um, there's a distinction between deaf with a small d and deaf with a capital D. The, um, the capital D community really uh, doesn't see themselves as, as disabled or handicapped. They simply are a community with a different language. The, uh, what, the sixth, uh, six month prevalent language in the United States. They have their own uh, culture, their own syntax, their own grammar, their own uh, civil rights movement, uh, their own folklores, their own mores. Uh, and as such, it was, a, uh, it was a real culture shock for me. I think what happened the first time I baptized the baby of, a, of deaf parents, uh, and they said to me, we're so proud, our baby is deaf. Now, for most of us, having a, having, having, or hearing about a deaf child or a deaf baby, uh, is, oh, that's so sad. For the community, it is not sad at all. They're members of the tribe. Uh, it's a matter of pride. We, um, it's, at St. Tim's, we have, in an attempt to, uh, to develop solidarity with the deaf community, we have probably 80 uh, deaf individuals when we have a deaf priest, we have, it drops down to about 20 when it's simply an interpreted uh, mass. But the hearing community has adopted the, the American Sign Language side for Alleluia, the Gospel Alleluia. Five minutes, thank you. And I'm sure visitors who don't know what's going on are mystified that we've got hearing people scattered throughout the entire congregation that are making the sign of a touchdown. Uh, right before the gospel. But in fact, that is the sign for, for Alleluia. Uh, as I say, we, we do it as a sign of solidarity. Our confirmation program, we had 12 deaf students who merged with about 42 hearing students. And um, at, the, at the confirmation, we had both hearing and deaf individuals doing the readings. We, uh, the, 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 deaf, uh, the deaf kids taught the hearing kids had a sign during confirmation there was a duel of baptismal vows. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And the answer is, I do. Well, if you can imagine 50 kids all signing, I do, <laughs> to the Archbishop, and it was like nobody was speaking. Nobody was vo vo voicing the responses. They were just signing the, uh, the responses. That and the Alleluia, with 50 kids, 50 sponsors, 50 families, uh, just blew his socks off. It was just a, a very emotional experience for him. We've, uh, we've integrated our deaf, uh, deaf members into both uh, lectors and uh, communion ministers at St. Tim's. When they are when they're lecturing, they uh, when they when they lecture, they uh, we have it voiced by uh, by one of the other uh, parishioners, one of the hearing parishioners. Currently, we have four parishes in the archdiocese: Litchfield, uh, Litchfield, Hartford, and um, New Haven counties, uh, with interpreted masses. And uh, one of the things there's a distinction for the deaf community between an interpreted mass and a mass celebrated by a deaf priest or a priest fluent in sign language. 
they make the, the analogy, it's like watching a French film with subtitles when it's just an interpreted uh, mass. There are only nine deaf priests in the United States. I understand there's only four Jewish rabbis who are deaf in the United States. Uh, so it's a, it's a real, real problem. Uh, we had a deaf priest who was here for two years. He was in a, it was a, a quasi-religious order that uh, was uh, suddenly closed uh, out in Illinois, which prompted, excuse me, Father Tom Coughlin to have to return uh, to that, that diocese. So the deaf community is at a real loss. This happened just uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, by the said we're doing, uh, what I've been able to do is obtain four deaf priests who are willing to come once a month to, uh, to St. Tim's or to, to a parish here at uh, the Hartford Archdiocese to be able to celebrate mass for them. And when, I, you know, when, I, when I'm confronted by my deaf friends who say, why can't we get a deaf priest? My question is, why isn't your deaf son studying to become a priest? <laughs> Yeah. But uh, that's my, that's my uh, faith journey so far. Amy, got it? So, uh, when I was 10, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. Uh, no, doctors don't diagnose anyone with that anymore. Um, it's only um, autism or the broad autism spectrum disorder. So now I just say that I have autism and talk about that in the past tense like I have autism because I've always had it. Um, and after the time that I was diagnosed, um, I tried my best to ignore it when I could because I saw it as like a thorn in my side that would uh, stop me from doing the things that I wanted to do. Uh, I consider myself to be adventurous. Uh, I like to do crazy things like uh, try skydiving simulation or writing a book or getting a seminary degree. And... Um, <laughs> And, um, <laughs> and so I would always see autism as something that would stop me from doing any of the things that I wanted to do. Um, now, so I grew up in the church, um, in the Presbyterian church, and church was a, uh, was a positive experience for me. It was a happy experience. I'm not here today because uh, church ruined religion for me or ruined anything for me because that was where I got my start with everything that I'm doing now. Um, and so I was always uh, drawn to the spiritual life and the, li and the life of liturgy because I, that's how I what I like to say, life is your liturgy. And... Um, and this was before I was even diagnosed, uh, so it had always been um, a good experience for me, and I didn't really need any extra provisions in order to be um, the, the Im immersed in the congregation, if I wanted that. Um, it wasn't... So then I started to get really interested in... Um, the subject of religion more generally, and that's when I went on to get a bachelor's degree in that and wanted to go on to get a master's degree in that, and that's why I came here. And it wasn't until I came here that I got the idea of combining what I know about autism with what I know about religion. And it was the first time that I started to, th that I started to think of of, of me as autistic, less in terms of the limitations and in terms of the opportunities it could bring. I had never thought of it that way before. And since then, I started to develop um, my own uh, disability-infused theology. So all of that is relatively new to me. And I saw that I could really combine those things and that could become my niche and what I do. So getting invested in the disability theology 
didn't start from my own need for liberation, but for others' need for liberation. Because I knew that this was a great need. It hadn't been talked about as much. More people are, are knowing about autism these days, talking about it. And I saw that there was a need for other autistics to have a champion for their needs who understands how they think, understands what they go through, and I thought I had this vision of seeing that kind of world, the, the world that I was looking for. And that's where my investment in disability theology came from. But I was also able to um, apply it to my own personal philosophy and my own approach to life. And the important thing to me is that disabilities, whatever they are, it does not come from being broken. It does not come from a world that is broken. It is not less than ideal. It is not about getting to the point where you can shave off what it is about the disability that, that makes you unique. It is part of who you are and it's something that you can embrace if you want to. Uh, for me, it's been all about reclaiming the language and the definitions. Because autism has long been defined by people who don't have it. And, and so, yeah. And, and the, like, I can speak for myself. <laughs> Anyone, like, any autistic can speak for themselves. And I'm, and I want to fit in the definitions, not in terms of the externals, but in terms of the internals, because of how I have to live with it every day. So having the opportunities to be a leader and, and really invest in your interests and using that as a way to give back to the world and support the world and serve the world is where I think a lot of autistics, such as myself, can uh, really claim their liberation and see themselves as a unique reflection of God, how we are all made in the image of God. And um, in churches especially, that's been where um, a lot of my uh, research has been in trying to make the churches uh, more inclusive. Um, it, 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 I don't, it doesn't matter to me as much um, for my own personal inclusion because I don't care what anyone else thinks and I don't care if they think if, if they if they look twice at what I do because I don't care what they think um, but it's especially with uh, children or adults who, who need who need those uh, who, who, who need provisions I'm all about making sure they get those things and that's what we're here to talk about today Amen. So that's my introduction. <laughs> Amen. Erica, let me take this. All right, so um, Erica Thompson, uh, as Candace <coughs> said, um, I am at Asylum Hill Congregational Church uh, just down the road uh, from the seminary. Um, by way of introduction, um, I am the daughter of a UCC minister, uh, so I grew up in the church, um, and much like Amy, I would say I had a good experience um, with church um, and, and places that uh, I called spiritual homes um, throughout, my, throughout my life. Um, I would say, also by way of introduction, I am a, uh, a returned, I love uh, the government uh, labels, but I am an RPCV, which is a returned Peace Corps volunteer. Um, uh, does not mean returned, uh, well, that might be up for discussion. Uh, I wasn't returned on bad behavior, uh, just did my time uh, and was done with my service. Um, 
as uh, somebody in my 20s uh, before going to seminary. And I think that that speaks to um, something that is incredibly important to me, which is community building. Um, and that has been something that has, uh, I think, always sort of been from, from childhood, but then into the decisions I've made uh, in places that I've gone in my life um, it has been really I am about community building. Um, and um, I often say like peanut butter, uh, I happen to love peanut butter, so I will use any mechanism to get peanut butter into uh, my system. Uh, my finger, a spoon, celery, a cracker, um, I will do almost anything to be about community building. So whether that's church or whether that's uh, in, in secular, um, but I really will do almost anything to be involved um, in uh, the concept of community building. Um, um, I will say, uh, the theologically, when Candace was talking about this, um, uh, our sacred texts, my sacred texts as, as Christians, um, uh, you know, especially the, the gospel stories, uh, Jesus does a lot of healing. Um, the gospel uh, texts are full of uh, either uh, Jesus healing folks or even uh, teaching in parables about different healing uh, concepts, and I, um, I really see the the stories um, in these texts um, that when you look at them, most of them are not about Jesus healing because there was something wrong with people. They are healing because Jesus wants people to be in community with one another. Um, there's something that there is a healing of mind, body, spirit that is keeping people out of community with one another. Um, and so um, I think it's a reframing of some of those sacred texts as if there is something wrong um, and there is a need for healing. Um, the need is not that there's something wrong. The need is for us to be in community with one another. Um, at Asylum Hill um, Congregational Church, I, I was sort of jotting some notes, and um, you know, as you were as you were speaking, um, you know, I look at some of the things that we are doing. Um, uh, Candice has been incredibly helpful to us uh, over the years in helping us to look at our uh, our space. Um, our physical plant, but also just the ways in which we worship, the ways that we uh, are in community with one another. Um, you know, we have we have put some uh, measures in place, um, done some things that I think are um, when we look at access and we look at entry. Um, you know, trying to not just physically, but also be as accessible um, as we can. Um, you know, things like doors and uh, just recently, you know, it just always amazes me. You, you do something and then you're like, oh, we need to do a little more. We recognize that we have doors that open um, with a button, but then we have a doorbell to get into the, um, the, the space. We say, listen for the buzzer, and when you do that, open the door. It's like, Oh, so now we have a green button. So instead of just a buzzer, there's a green button. So, um, you know, just continuing, you know, signage, elevators, walkways, you know, those are all things that are important um, and that we have, we have done. Yes, five minutes. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Um, um, I will say in terms of our worship life, um, you know, some things that we have over time implemented. Um, you know, we do have an interpreter um, that is with us every Sunday morning uh, at our 1015 worship service. Um, and uh, whether or not we have uh, people who are uh, in the actual sanctuary on a given Sunday, uh, we still have that interpretation uh, ministry happening uh, because we do have live streaming, and so there may be people who are watching on the live stream um, that are, are able, um, I know even Candace has said that she has been able to live stream and still have access. Um, um, we, um, we, provide or there are, uh, there's access to um, interpreters at some of our programming. Um, 
we have um, screens in our worship service, and and it was not. We are not a, a sort of an evangelical church community by any means. Um, but we have, we've sensed that that has really opened up new ways of uh, providing access for people. Um, we've been able to do song lyrics or some of our liturgy um, has been able, we, you know, we've been able to do that on the screens. Um, and so it, it's been, it, that's been very, very helpful. Um, you know, we have assistant, uh, assisted hearing, uh, large print bulletins, you know, those kinds of things. Um, our choir, uh, both our children's choir and our adult choirs, um, at times have uh, learned how to sign uh, particular pieces of their, their songs um, or their gifts of music. Um, um, I will say in terms of our belief system, um, so entry, access, worship life, our belief system, you know, we always talk about our communion table being open. Um, open to all. Um, we uh, started a um, in 2003. Uh, we adopted a statement of inclusiveness and diversity, uh, which is a wonderful uh, statement that is broad uh, and bold in terms of um, the inclusiveness. And I think, as you were talking, um, you know, it's it's not just about sort of the doors are open, y'all come in. Um, you know, it talks about uh, our church being a space that's inclusive um, in leadership, in rites and sacraments, in, in worship leadership. Um, and um, we have, uh, there's two, um, there are two uh, men in particular um, who have uh, intellectual disabilities who are, um, uh, who are, very well, um, very well integrated into the life of our church and and worship, and um, and the reason probably we know them is there is a lot of talk back in worship. Um, there is a lot of uh, uh, you know public conversation um, that happens. Um, uh, my favorite, I will say, is um, after the 2016 election, um, one of the men in coffee hour um, stood up and very, very loudly, um, uh, using very, very uh, profane words, um, talked about his displeasure of um, our president. And uh, I loved it because one of the most conservative people uh, in the church, walked up and just said, oh, I love you. Would you like to go have a cup of coffee? And I thought, okay, all right, we're going to make it through. <laughs> um, but that's a, that's a little bit about who we are and what we're doing. Hi, I'm Lynn. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I wasn't always in a wheelchair. Although I developed multiple sclerosis 30 years ago, uh, I have the rarest form, and it's a slow, steady decline and loss of ability. But I have been blessed to have 40 years of my life where I was completely able, and I experienced what it's like to be an able-bodied person in a congregation. So I speak to you today from two sides. One perspective is being able-bodied in a church and being very vaguely aware of the struggles of people with disabilities. And now I'm on the other side. I'm a person with a disability and I'm very aware of the struggles of people with disabilities. I also have experience uh, in congregations, uh, for me, it's uh, a Christian. I'm a Christian, so it's churches. Uh, I grew up, I, I've experienced in different congregations. I grew up in a Methodist church, and I became a convinced Quaker in my 20s, and now I attend a wonderful congregational church. I have also worked as a pastoral counselor in two different churches. One is the, the first church congregational in West Hartford in the early 90s, where I had to walk up four flights of stairs to my office. 
I can't believe I used to do that. But luckily, I mean blessedly, now they have an elevator. When I wanted to found my own counseling center, the Center for Serenity, I went uh, and looking around and I drove into the parking lot of the First Baptist Church in West Hartford. And I saw there a little sign that said, handicap lift. And I said, thank you, Lord. This is where I belong. So let's see, what else do I want to tell you? I'm a member of the Hartford Monthly Meeting of the Religious Society of Friends. That's the full name of Quakers. And I always taught Sunday school. So those of you who know, who teach Sunday school, know that you have to be able to run around after the kids. Uh, that got harder and harder as I progressed from a cane, then to a walker, and then just very recently to a wheelchair. So, um, I had to walk up and down the couple of flights of stairs to access all of the meeting, and I saw my Quaker friends looking at me with great concern. They were afraid I was going to fall. So they started having these meetings where they were discussing putting in a handicap lift. Now I confess to you, I did not go to the meetings because uh, I know, and I know from talking from friends that have disabilities, it's, it's very embarrassing. I'm always worried, like I was tonight, about making people move around, inconveniencing people, being in the way, all that stuff. So I didn't want my little Quaker meeting that struggles so hard to meet its modest budget. I mean, how in the world were they going to have the money to, to do the construction to put in the handicap lift? So I stayed away from those meetings. But they went ahead. And they decided to do a capital campaign. And by gum, they raised the money. It took a while, but they did it. And we did it. And put on a beautiful, uh, really restructured the building uh, to put on a gorgeous handicap lift. So now I can ride in style up and down to all the floors. Uh, but sadly, my disease kept progressing. And uh, now I'm in a wheelchair. That, that only happened about three years ago. And then I had to give up driving, and I had to give up teaching Sunday school, which was really, really sad to me. And I could get to meeting, but it got very hard, because I had to take my handicapped van, and I had to get up real early in the morning, and I don't do very well in the mornings. So it got to be a real struggle just to go. And one of my friends said, why don't you try out the first congregation, the, uh, no, Emmanuel Church, right down the street, uh, which is about half a block from where I live. So I found I could wheel myself uh, there, which was very exciting to me. And uh, if I just waited across the street, five minutes, okay, uh, I could find someone to get me across the street and up the hill into the church. There I was really welcomed, really welcomed. However, I had to sit in the aisle. Now sitting in the aisle is, is very awkward uh, for a person like me. It's a little embarrassing. I always felt in the way, always had to move out of the way of everybody walking through. And I didn't feel, I didn't feel a part of the congregation. But blessedly, Candace had just been to the church and done a consult. And they had in their mind that they wanted to, to cut out some pews for um, wheelchairs and walkers. And so the wonderful carpenter of the church did. And he cut out my favorite pew. So I feel like that's my place. And now I feel so happy there and so much a part of the congregation. So, let's see, what else do I want to tell you? Okay, so I want to speak to the disabled people in the room. First of all, I don't like that word disabled. I'm with Amy. Um, I've, my MS has been such a blessing to me. I have learned so much. It has been a teacher to me and brought me closer to God. It truly has. Uh, I see... 
our disabilities as abilities. I, I, uh, well, no, okay, Amy says no. No. But have you been following Greta Thunberg, who has Asperger's, yeah. and who says that her Asperger's is a superpower? Um, so I would like to talk about our abilities, the abilities within our disabilities, such as my disability has taught me how to be more compassionate and observant of others. Really wasn't like that so much when I was able-bodied. So this is what I want to say to, to those of us who are disabled. If you don't have a spiritual community and you want one and you're interested in maybe finding out more about one, go. Take a friend and go. Go with an empty bladder. And go, with, <laughs> go with an empty bladder and go with an open heart. It's important. And just find out. And then tell whoever is there what it's like for you. Did you have a hard time getting in the door? Could you use the bathroom? You know, was there a place for you to sit? Could you hear the people talking? Could you hear the service? Could you see the bulletin? Tell, tell them. They'll listen. And if you want to be a part of this community, keep going back and keep telling them what you need because there's lots of kind people who will listen and congregations act when they see the need, just like the Quakers did and just like the Emmanuel did. So keep going back and don't give up if that's what you want. Okay, now I want to speak to the able-bodied people in the room. I suggest that each faith community builds a team of allies. Um, I like the word allies. We borrow it from the LGBT community. They've had a lot of good success with allies. Build a team of allies. Um, Teach the allies to go to, to watch for people with disabilities, go over to them. One of the things is really hard when you have a disability, like I experienced over there. I was sitting over there, I wanted to speak to Stan, I wanted to speak to MT when she came in the room. I couldn't get across to the room to them. You have to go to people like me with disabilities because we can't get to you so easy. So go to them, talk to them, listen to them, ask them what would make their experience better in your community. So that's what we need, I think. And I just, I told you before, I don't like the word disability. I don't like disability month. I like to call it ability month. Let's look at what our abilities are and what our abilities are together. Because together, we can make this an accessible world for people of faith and for everyone. Thanks. Thank you, panel. We'll move on to our second question. I see um, a lot of things. One thing that prompted this question was, unfortunately, we've had a lot of I don't know, opportunity, I don't really like the word opportunity for this particular thing, but a lot of things that have happened that have prompted the faith communities to get together and have different services for remembrance, services for healing, services for getting together and sharing grief. And so this second question was prompted by the fact that even though many of these services are partnered with other faith communities, other faith organizations, they're not accessible. They're not held in an accessible place. And thought to having it interpreted never really happens. And things happen and you look at the shootings and things that have been going on. They've been involving people with disabilities. We need to have a way to join in community to grieve with everyone else. And so 
this particular experience prompted this second question. And it's something I want you to think about for your group. It's how can the various faith communities work together to build a more inclusive community as a whole within specific faith communities and in the broader community? And I'll start with Kathy. We have a little bit less than five minutes. So I think, um, to answer this question, I think we really need to build bridges in community. Uh, it's so important to know one another. I have to say that I had no idea about all kinds of things before I knew Candace. Uh, and she really opened my eyes to a lot of things that I, I should know in my community, that my community should be aware of. Um, recently, we had uh, the American School for the Deaf um, had, I think, 10 Saudi students who wanted to come to services on Friday. And, um, and they were able to come, and they had an, inter a, a, an interpreter with them. We had a special uh, uh, arrangement where they had the whole of the basement. They could see everything um, very clearly, and they had uh, a, an excellent young woman coming to inter interpret f for them. And so it, was, it, it, it opened our eyes to what the possibilities were. And I think once we start learning about each, each other and the needs of others, we have to just make inroads into those various um, uh, positions. Um, 
So I think really, I think one of the things that may help, and I and I, I really would like everybody to to give me that feedback, is if we have open houses at various faith institutions, where we talk about the, the the challenges and how we have overcome them and how we aim to overcome them. I think that would be really very useful. Um, we you know, in the Muslim community, there's a lot of misconceptions about Islam and Muslims, and open houses really sort of you know, sort of uh, encourage people to talk to one another and to get to know one another and those one to one relationships are vital that's all I'm saying nice i know um, a lot of the the interrelate the interfaith relationships are uh, individually dr uh, driven my old pastor uh, henry cody uh, had a very uh, strong relationship to the rabbi at uh, Beth David uh, Synagogue. I, I, I'm not aware of, I know in years past there have been a, uh, a collect, collective meeting of the pastors and ministers uh, in West Hartford. I don't know if that's gone by the boards. And if anyone knows of it, if you yes. drop me a line and let me know, I'd, I'd love to participate in that. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, you mentioned the open house <laughs> shortly after the, the mosque in, uh, in Meriden uh, was, was shut up. I attended a service there. Unfortunately, I, uh, I went without socks in brand new shoes. And if you've been to a mosque, you take your shoes off. Well, nobody had a shoehorn to put the back, my shoes back on with, the, with these brand new shoes. But it was a wonderful experience uh, and one that I think uh, really does build uh, interrelationships. Uh, but, um, I don't know. I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> okay. So just to put some of my some more of my own cards on the table, um, I I refer to myself as disabled. I refer to myself as autistic uh, because it's not something that I have. It's something that I am. And. I, 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 don't, I don't care about making that distinction. To me, it's not a positive or a negative, it just is. And it's something that does cause impairments and does cause struggles, and I don't want to minimize that. I want to see that as like, I, I want that to be recognized as something that happens to me. It's not a bad thing to be autistic, but it's also not something that I would wish on someone else because of what it comes with. So, and like, there, I get really irritated over like the insistence on saying people with autism versus autistic. The difference between those two things is one is an adjective and one uses a preposition. That's the only difference. It means the same thing. And so all of this quibbing over language I find sometimes in the presentations I give distracts from the main point. Um, so that just that's just one example of how not everyone at this table is going to think the same way. Not every uh, disabled person or disabilities is going to think the same way. So you really need to ask them what it is that they need and how they want things implemented. And that leads into um, uh, different uh, different forms of um, uh, approaches to autism in society that I have noticed. For a long time, we had been talking about autism awareness, like knowing about autism. Okay, but then a lot of us autistics were like, "But autism awareness is not enough because we also want we we also want." Acceptance. So then it started talking about autism acceptance. Don't just know who we are, accept who we are. For, okay, that was a good, good next step. From there, we've now started talking more about autism inclusion. How we can be accepted, but also how spaces can be created around our needs and for us. The, the next step that I want it to go to, the term that I'm using, is autism contribution. So not only included in spaces, but given the opportunity to contribute to them and using our talents. So I think all four of those things are things that need to go together as steps. Sometimes you can't jump to the last step right away because you do need to be informed about 
what the disabilities are and how they affect things. But I think that the, the final and culminating step in how to make a, um, a, a, a truly welcoming community is when everyone is an important and active and contributing member to the community and not just an add-on, but integral to it. Wonderful. I, I don't know that I have much more to contribute. <laughs> um, um, I, uh, I was going to use actually some of the same words that you did, um, which are, I think it's impossible for us to uh, create um, any kind of community, interfaith or otherwise, um, for any purpose if we don't know one another. And, and so I think the, the creation of, um, of communities, uh, whether it's vigils or justice related, um, you know, anything, we have to know one another. Um, and so I think uh, the, f the first step in, in making sure that uh, we can do that work together is just in simply taking the time uh, to get to know one another, I think, and to, as you said, Amy, you know, understand um, what, not just what people's needs are, but ways in which each of us can contribute. Okay. Beautifully said. Um, what I'd like to propose, Candace asked us to look at what, what can we do beyond this conference? Where can we go next? And listening to the, the idea of developing community, what I would like to suggest is that we form an interreligious community or task force, whatever we want to call it, that would be interested in becoming ally, ally, allies to people with disabilities. Uh, we look to Molly, maybe, to uh, be our fiduciary. We get a grant. We form, we have training for people who want to learn how to support people with autism so they can contribute, support people with wheelchairs, support people who are deaf, support people with disabilities. So that's my proposal for us to think about. Thank you. That was great. Um, we have a, a few minutes before we break out. Uh, if you need a sugar rush, there are still cookies back there on the table, hopefully. Uh, there's one cookie. Oh, she gave the time one. I thought, oh my God, there's one cookie. <laughs> Where well, is Jesus when we need to have the 5,000, you know? Um, oh, we have about five minutes for questions. If you have a question for a specific panel member, please say who that question is for so that we can get the microphone where it needs to be. Okay. Do you have a question? Okay. What's the question? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to Kathy for remembering to include those of us with the invisible disabilities. Because a lot of times that's overlooked, and that kind of segues kind of way into Lynn said at the end here. When you, I like the idea of having the, the training for people to understand about autism, but I hope you're going to consider that the people providing that training should be autistic, because mm -hmm. nobody can can tell you more about being, you know, what what it is to be mm -hmm. autistic than the autistic people themselves. So they should be considered. I'm going to interject there and say I don't think that's necessarily true. Like even speaking as someone who wants to give the uh, who wants to give a lot of the autism voice back to autistics, 
uh, the, what you should really find is whoever is most qualified to give that type of training, and an autistic isn't necessarily qualified to give that type of training. So I don't think that that has to be a um, that that has to be a prerequisite for running that type of workshop. Um, someone who, someone who doesn't have it can still be qualified to speak on it, um, just depending on how they do it. So I don't think that 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 has to be. <laughs> part of the equation personally <coughs> I don't think I don't think a qualification is that you have to have it I really don't but a person with autism could be qualified to speak as well sure they could and then maybe you want to choose them over that but if you don't have that as an option then you can go with someone who's non autistic so maybe teams of all kinds of different people do right this. yeah or at least have the, that person get input from actually autistic people but yeah, I mean, someone who is doing their job right will. And uh, I did want to say one thing. Is it Ada? Yeah. Um, I just had a little objection to your use of the word tantrum. I'd like to just make the distinction between a meltdown and a tantrum. Sure. A tantrum is a behavior issue, which is almost like a, a choice that the person has an, an option and, and has control over. Mm -hmm. An autistic meltdown we have absolutely no control over. It's because the sensory environment has just become too much to tolerate and just completely lost you know, control. And, and it's, there's a difference. And it's, it's, it's kind of um, insulting and, and degrading to Sorry, to I'm it as a tantrum, because it is not a tantrum. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we have time for one more question before we break out. Yes. I just want to thank everybody for being here and having this. I'm a mother of a, of a son with autism, and um, I can really relate to you. And also, um, I, I just think we, we have to just accept where we all come from, because like, people like the word tantrum, but as a mother, I get that, because that's what the world sees. And when you were talking about the different uh, labels and, and, and it gets so confusing and one person yeah don't call it special needs it's like oh my god i've called mm -hmm. my whole life and i don't mean any disrespect to my son or anybody i, I just want to help my son and i have and you know help everybody with this issues or whatever you want to call it i just think our intentions are very important and then they would get gentle and suggest the right language but sometimes like you were saying yeah more about semantics yeah, I think that similar to on the point about about tantrums, um, it, it's I think that that like sometimes we can use these words as a as a way to um, as a way to like subvert what they're trying to get at. That like the world perceives it as a tantrum, and I'm tired of that. Type of thing, um, so um, I I think that you know w we can sometimes use use the language in an almost satirical way, and in that sense, that's fine. Yeah, so I'm with you. I just I get really tired of the language wars because our our energy is better divested in something something that actually makes a difference. I'd like to say something about the language. Um, I've been, I, I've been very good about keeping my mouth shut while other people talk tonight, which is kind of unusual for me. But I've been a disability activist for about 45 years. And back in the early times, people used the word crippled, we used the word handicapped, we used the word deaf mute, we used a lot of very negative, derogatory words to describe people with disabilities. So our fight in the beginning was for people to look at us as people because we were in institutions, we were in the closets, we were hidden. And at the very beginning of the disability rights movement, people didn't recognize people with disabilities of having any value. And we weren't seen as people. Unfortunately, today, we're kind of going backwards into this not seeing us as people again. But the fight for people first language, I know you've all heard of it, 
to fight for people first language was to get some kind of uniform language that was more positive than the other things that people were using to talk about when we talked about language. So we went to people first language because we're a part of humanity, but nobody was seeing us as a person. And as a disability rights activist, I've seen the language develop over the years. As we've developed our culture, we've developed a lot of languages that's grown. I see now the movement with the younger people especially, they want identity first language, which is their disability first. They want to be seen for their disability first, identity first language. I look at that at first I thought, gee, you know, it bothered me for a little while. And then I looked at it again and I thought, well, we did our job. Because if the young people feel like that they can identify as people with disabilities, first with their disability and not having to fight for people first language. It means that the advocates did their job to try to remove some of the stereotypes to the language. Now we have people that want to be called disabled. We have people that want to be called people with disabilities. We have people that want to be called various other things. Um, it's huge. Big D, little D drives me nuts. Sorry. But, <laughs> I'm not a big D, so see, I'm jealous, you know, I'm a little D. I became late, deaf, and adults, mm -hmm. but we have these language wars inside the disability community also. We have mental health, we have mental illness, we have all of it. I think the key word here, I want to say one word, is ask the person what they want to be called. And call them by their name. I have a problem with this, not calling people with a name, but I remember faces. But part of my cognitive disability with my brain injury is that I have a horrible time remembering names. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. Now, if you don't have a brain injury and you can't remember names, you're going to have to think of your own story with that. But the key word I think we have when we talk about language wars is tolerance. We all need to learn the word tolerance Amen. and whatever language is used out there, we have to understand where it comes from and try to be tolerant with it and ask the person, you know. Um, and like I said at the beginning of this, for this, I really would love if we could just get rid of the labels that we see people and look past that and see that person's heart and see their soul. That's where I come from. Now we have some people left, unfortunately, but we have we need to have a breakout. And we need to have um, we will have maybe about you have about thirty minutes because we have travel time. Now I don't mean travel to the parking lot. We're gonna know if you're gone. But one table, as I designated, needs to go to the library. One needs to go uh, back there. And each, each person on the panel is going to sit in at a table and direct your questions. We are. Um, and the questions are, what does the faith community need from us, the planners of this particular conference? What do you envision as our next steps? And how can you partner with someone to do what? Build your connections with each other. Okay. This table goes to the library. This table goes to the chapel. <laughs>